that. Uh, what we also learned is that uh, viruses are actually a pretty bad bunch of things. Uh, what we may not have learned yet, but will learn today, is that some viruses are actually different. Not all viruses are created equal. Some are actually quite useful, can be quite useful. And that's something what we are going to hear today from our two guests, um, the founders of Fagomate. Before we dive into that, let me briefly explain what Twist Talks are about uh, for those that haven't joined us before. Uh, Twist is the tech transfer office of IST Austria. The institute is dedicated to uh, research on, on top level in, in natural and formal sciences. But we also think that science has multiple roles to play in society. And one of those roles is that it creates products, technology, services. And in so far, we try to inspire our community, the community of scientists at IST, but also beyond by a number of activities. And those twist talks is one, one of these activities. The, the twist team curates and organizes these talks where we bring in people from different areas, usually former scientists, to tell our community what can be done beyond science, beyond the next publication, but also thinking about um, what could be the next product, service, or startup, actually. So without much ado, I would like to introduce today's speakers, uh, Alexander Belgredi and Lorenzo Corsini. Um, they come from quite diverse backgrounds. And at some point, their path of life kind of crossed and now run in parallel, probably, I would say so. Um, Alexander is by education a historian and, and an economist. He studied at the University of St. Andrews and holds an MBA from INSEAD. After that, he joined BCG, um, a consultancy, probably a, a step that many people do that want to do interesting things and have not quite figured out yet what this could be. Now he found this thing, actually. Um, Lorenzo, um, however, had a very different um, education background. He studied biochemistry at, um, at the University of Frankfurt, if I remember correctly, yes. Um, and continued uh, his education for a PhD at the European Molecular Biology Lab. Also went afterwards to, well, first he, he joined Sanofi, uh, made first experiences in the pharmaceutical industry, um, followed by another stand of eight years with BCG. Both of the founders today worked in the, in the pharma and healthcare industry, and at some point decided, and we will learn more about how that happened, that they want to do something more entrepreneurial in the field of pharmaceuticals. And that's actually where the story of Fagomet began. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing more about it. For those who join us today, please um, think about questions. We have time enough after their presentation to, to ask questions. Please uh, type them in the, in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. And we'll come back to your questions in the in the Q and A part of the Twist Talk. With that, Lorenzo Alexander, thanks for being here, and looking forward to your story. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for inviting us. Uh, thanks everybody for joining our talk and for being interested in in our presentation. I'm going to share my screen. Um, we focus on uh, really uh, providing just a minimum amount of slides just to structure the, the presentation. Uh, we, we, we don't have a lot of slides. C can you see my slides? Yes? Okay, so um, we're gonna start by, uh, so first of all, thanks Alexander for the, the very kind introduction. Um, we're gonna uh, just give our perspective a little bit broader how we got to where we are uh, we're going to um, uh, introduce uh, just our uh, our own path, our personal paths, um, and then uh, discuss a little bit about Fagomate, how we got uh, where we are now, and what the problems were uh, that we had to solve, and uh, and where where we're going um, in the future. So, as um, Alexander explained already, I, I studied biochemistry in Frankfurt. Um, actually, I. At school, I always wanted to study electrical engineering because I was really fascinated how what things can be done, how like uh, um, 
uh, how, yeah, how, how circuits can be engineered and, and uh, everything, how everything depends on electricity and all the, the versatility of what you can do with it. And then at some point I read about biochemistry and then I was fascinated and somehow I thought maybe a bit naively that um, also biological systems could be engineered a bit like electrical circuits. And, and so I studied biochemistry. And um, always during my course of studies, I, I thought about uh, um, founding a company um, from those early days. I, I somehow didn't know what exactly to, to found and in which area. Um, so yeah, I, I sort of also knew that to, to really engineer biological systems, I would need to do a PhD. Um, and so for, for the lack of a better idea, I, I started uh, a PhD at EMBL. But at the time already, I, I had one role model. There was a, an older student who had founded a company um, uh, as a spin-off out of the university in Frankfurt. Uh, and that was a, 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 they had developed a, a way to uh, do paternity tests. And at the time, they, they were actually quite successful with it. They had um, appearances in various talk shows where at the time there was uh, sort of early 2000s where um, there were all these talk shows where there were surprise paternity tests and they were doing all the paternity tests for all the uh, for all those shows and uh, uh, so that was sort of the first time that I saw that somebody quite close to me I, I knew the the, uh, the the student um had founded a company that 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 was actually viable well so I studied biochemistry um started a PhD at EMBL um in in a in a field that I was interested in, that was uh, NMR and structural biology, and I was doing uh, crystal structural ana analysis. Also, we were analyzing um, uh, pre-mRNA complexes and, and how mRNA, uh, how, how alternative pre-mRNA splicing is regulated, and uh, very basic science stuff. But I sort of always knew that I didn't want to do a postdoc and, and didn't want to continue with the classic um, academic pathway. Um, because still I had in the back of my mind this idea that I wanted to start a company. So we had like uh, also gatherings at EMBL where we were thinking, okay, what, what, who has an idea? What, sh what should we found? What sort of company? We, we had some ideas, participated in some business plan competitions, but nothing was really so great that I thought, okay, that's, that's what I really want to do. And so a bit like Alexander said, for, for, for lack of a better idea, I, I went on to, to BCG because I knew, okay, that's, that's going to be interesting. Um, and I'm going to learn at least how, how companies work. And in fact, at BCG, I mean, my, one of my first projects was a, a post-merger integration of uh, two of the top 10 at the time biopharma companies that were merging into the one largest biopharma company in the world. And we were merging all the different departments, so that was a perfect uh, environment to to understand how biopharma works and how yeah, all, all the different departments in biopharma work. And um, continued in biopharma, uh, specializing more and more towards uh, biomanufacturing. Um, so at at some point, then, as a project leader, later as a principal, uh, I was uh, yeah really specialized in working in in uh, factories, uh, in helping big pharmaceutical companies improve um, how they produce pills, how aseptic manufacturing is done, uh, sterile injectables, but also how uh, biopharmaceuticals are manufactured. And um, uh, so this was uh, my, yeah, everything I did for, for a number of years at, at PCG until I met Alexander at PCG in in uh, in Vienna, uh, uh, sort of in the canteen, drinking coffee, and he started to talk about phages and whether uh, whether I saw a, uh, an opportunity of of developing pharmaceuticals out of that, and so we founded Fagomate at some point, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. Um, but now I'm going to hand over to Alexander, who also um, uh, will give a bit of background in 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 where he came from. So I'll try to keep it uh, to keep it sort of short, given that Alexander already sort of gave you the, the highlights of where I come from. Um, the basic gist is I have nothing to do with science whatsoever, and yet they ended up in, in a biotech. 
which is either a very fortunate or an unfortunate combination, and, and I'll let you judge that. Basically, what did I do? I was always fascinated by, um, by business, and I was always fascinated by history, and so I sought a university where I could study both, and that was in, in Scotland, um, where uh, the Scottish system allows master students to take two different courses, um, and you only had to do 50% of credits in each of the courses instead of needing to do 100% of the, the credits in each of the courses. So that made perfect sense. Um, off I went to Scotland, uh, then knew I wanted to move into business and, and work in companies. And so for me, consulting was the ideal pathway into that. Uh, and so that's where I started my career. Um, I then liked it and I stayed for quite a while, um, close to, to 10 years. Um, and uh, worked um, more or less from the start in the healthcare industry. So worked for pharmaceutical companies, worked for medical technology companies, um, and really enjoyed getting closer to medicine uh, in a certain way again. Um, so my mother is a medical doctor. I've always had an interest in, in medicine. Um, today, I maybe, if I start over, would have decided to study medicine, but obviously I didn't at the time. Uh, so, so that's the path I went. Um, but through my time at, at BCG, I got to get close to the medical field um, again um, and sort of knew that that if I was, was going to do something else, it was going to be in that field. And then probably the most important thing happened. Um, I got married. I met my, my father-in-law, um, who's a, a German um, orthopedic surgeon. And um, um, he really started us off on the journey uh, around phages and around the antibiotic crisis. Um, and uh, and that's somewhere, I'd say, 2014, 2015, when we started to get interested in it. And then you can see there's still a long time before we then actually founded Fagomed as a company when Lorenza and myself left our jobs at BCG, um, which to a certain degree is, is not that easy to do if you have sort of a career in a certain field and you've, you've invested a lot of time in that and you have a, a comfortable position then it is a big jump to jump into the entrepreneurship space and to start something. But it's a bit like a, a wave building up. Um, initially, Lorenzo, myself, um, we just met over coffee and we, we played around with ideas and we started to sort of discuss uh, what we could do, what we might do. Um, and at some point, sort of two years later, uh, it, it was sort of the time was to either do something about it or to let go of the idea and obviously, at that point, we then we then did something about it and left PCG to to found um, Fagomid. Maybe at this point, let's take a step back and, and just quickly talk a bit about why did we do it? What motivated us to to found a company in the phage space? And that really has has two parts. One part is the enormous efficacy of antibiotics in the past. 70, 80 years. Um, this is one of, of my favorite analysis, and it, it's really a very simple analysis. It's just the, the crude mortality rate for infectious and non-infectious causes. It's just the US. And what you can see very nicely is that from the 1920s onwards, just after the Spanish flu, you have that steady decline in the mortality rate from infectious diseases. And many things play a role here. Vaccines play a role, um, hygiene plays a role. But if we zoom in on something very simple, um, in this case, syphilis, you can see perfectly where antibiotics kick in. It's right about the middle of the 1940s when, um, thanks to Alexander Fleming and also the work of lots of Austrian scientists, um, penicillin starts taking off. Uh, we have all the other antibiotics discoveries and suddenly the crude mortality from syphilis goes down to exactly actually zero um, by the time we reach sort of the, the 1970s. So antibiotics have played a huge role in our health. And probably if you're like me and you grew up in a time when there was antibiotics around, bacteria never seemed that scary anymore. I mean, you got a bacterial infection, you took an antibiotics, you were fine, you, you moved on. And so it's, it's really now in the last sort of 10, 15 years that we're understanding that this, this miracle of medicine is sort of running out of steam. And um, there's a very famous study that was done by the British government, commissioned by the British government, which sort of looked at how might antibiotic resistance um, evolve over time? So how might um, bacteria uh, learn to become um, at an endpoint pan-resistant? So no antibiotic is able to, to effectively kill them. And they made a very scary estimate. They said, well, today around, what today? 
2015, uh, 700,000 people die every year from antibiotic resistant infections. That might go up to, to 10 million by 2050. And now to put it into perspective, we have about 8 million deaths from cancer worldwide today. So 10 million deaths from antibiotic resistance is actually a huge number. And that's a really, really scary scenario. And many of you might also be aware of the fact that for cancer, at least we have a very strong pipeline. We have lots of drugs being developed. We have lots of exciting new technologies being applied. We have between eight and 10 new drug approvals in the US every year. For antibiotics, not so much. We have very few novel antibiotics in development. We have very few that are being approved. And so this is, this is a real issue. And that's one part. The other part is what do we do about it? And that really takes us deep into, into phages where my first interaction was my father-in-law who as an orthopedic surgeon was dealing a lot with surgical infections that he could no longer cure, but he had found a way to apply phages. So let Lorenz introduce you what phages are, and then we'll pick up the story there again. Yeah, so you probably all know phages from your textbooks. Uh, they've been the, the, the viruses infecting only bacteria and spe specifically specific types of, of bacteria. They've been on earth probably since billions of years, since uh, phages, uh, sorry, since bacteria are on, uh, since bacteria exist. Um, they have been the uh, field of research for a long time and all the uh, major breakthroughs in molecular biology uh, were done with phages at the time of, let's say, Salvador Luria or, or Alfred Hershey and Max Delbrück when, when they were analyzing what genes actually are. Um, and uh, But uh, they also have been used a lot for actually treating bacterial infections. And there is a lot of literature on uh, animal models uh, that work really well on um, uh, in vitro models that work very well on occasional uh, usage in, in people. Um, and so it, it they are actually a, a, a viable, uh, let's say, alternative um, for treating um, bacterial infections. And um, so let's just look at the schematics because there, there is another aspect of, of phage of phages that are actually extremely interesting. So uh, obviously you know the uh, the lytic cycle in principle of the phages. The phage uh, binds to a bacterium, injects its DNA, uh, basically hijacks the metabolism of the bacteria. The bacteria start producing only phage uh, particles until at a certain stage of the infection, the, um, the uh, endolysins are produced, which uh, are also encoded on the genome of the phages. And these endolysins are enzymes that cleave the peptidoglycan of the cell wall, some steps in between, obviously, but, but uh, critically, the um, endolysins lead to a bursting of the cells and all the phage particles um, exit the cell and start the, the cycle again in a, um, in a sort of in, in an exponential reaction if, if there is uh, more bacteria than phages. So interestingly, um, turns out, Okay, you can use phages to treat bacterial infections, but you can also use the endolysins themselves. You could even say the phage is a complicated delivery mechanism for the endolysin. And um, while treating phages is something that has been done uh, yeah, since decades, since probably phages were discovered in uh, 1917, there, there was immediately like the, the first application was uh, using phages to treat uh, dysenteria. Um, <coughs> and using actually only the endolysins is a much more modern uh, concept that, um, that that you will see in a moment um, that we will um, uh, yeah that, that we also started investigating and, um, and and are pursuing. So why are phages not used? Uh, why are they not on the market as as pharmaceuticals? It's a it's a combination of different elements. Uh, so big pharma is more interested clearly in cancers. Uh, because there is more of a business model, prices are higher. Uh, in uh, in antimicrobials, you have all the generics uh, that are uh, yeah, very low price, but also um, up until a couple of years ago, uh, sequencing uh, was much more expensive than it is now. And, and to develop this in a scientific way, you absolutely need genomic sequencing, both of the bacteria and of the phages. Um, 
um, the, the the regulatory perspective was very unclear up until a couple of years ago. So we, we felt in 2017 when we started Fagomate that the time was right to uh, to actually start developing bacteriophages as pharmaceuticals. So in comes the team of uh, Alexander Borkart and myself. Borkart, as Alexander said, was using uh, phages already um, in, uh, in his uh, clinical practice as an orthopedic surgeon, and he's implanting artificial knees and hips and, um, uh, and, and uh, yeah, other uh, joints uh, on a regular basis, 400 per year in his department. And now and then they get infected. And when they get infected, it's real. It's a real problem because the, the biofilm that forms cannot be treated with antibiotics alone. Uh, you, you need to remove it by surgery. Um, and uh, sometimes uh, the, the antibiotics that you use to um, support the, the, those procedures just fail. Uh, the biofilms, you can't get rid of them sometimes. Uh, and the bacteria are resistant. Sometimes chronic wounds form. Uh, and he was treating phages with uh, patients with phages now and then over 20 years, something like one patient per year. Um, he saw quite some successes, but also was very frustrated that there was no um, approved pharmaceutical on the market. So we started to think and we, we were quite convinced that it would be possible to uh, develop a pharmaceutical doing that. Uh, the problem was we, so Alexander and I were still employed at BCG. Uh, we didn't have a lab, we, we didn't have money, we didn't have investors, we didn't have a patent, we didn't have data, uh, we didn't have employees. Uh, so we only had slides. And so how to start this? So I mean, we probably had the most important thing, which was really had an idea that we believed in. We believed that there was something around phages that, that will play a role in medicine. And at that time, we were more interested in the entire phage, not so much in the lysine, but obviously that was, that was a learning part for us. And so we really felt that this was the idea that was worth um, pursuing. Yeah? And it, it had built up over time. Yeah? As, as we said before, we'd started looking into space in 2015. We then went through many different discussions, interviews, uh, and, and sort of at the end decided the time was right to, to found the company. And so, I'll talk you through a bit the, the main steps that we took um, along the way. Um, and then Lorenzo will share a bit around sort of what, where our science stands currently, what we're doing. Um, and I'm very happy to, to open up to, to questions. So basically with the idea in hand, let's do phages, um, let's do something exciting. Let's work on implant infections, these artificial joints that become infected, um, but also let's work on women's health. Why women's health? Because um, the uh, vaginal microbiome is obviously the key microbiome in the body of a woman. And in that microbiome, you have good bacteria that you typically don't want to kill. And that's the lactobacilli uh, that populate the vaginal microbiome. And phages are something I've not fully mentioned before, but phages are obviously highly precise. Phages typically act on a single um, bacterial uh, species uh, or even strains within that species. And so we really thought that next to implant infections, we wanted to hedge our bets, uh, women's health and the vaginal microbiome would also be extremely exciting to work with, with a precision um, antibiotic. And so we chose urinary tract infections and bacterial vaginosis as sort of our trio of initial diseases we wanted to work on. We then applied for funding. We applied for um, FFG funding. We applied for AWS seed funding. And uh, together with those grants, we um, then convinced angel investors to come on board. And we basically played the game of you know, telling the grant agency, if you come on board, we'll have the angel investors to provide the equity that we need. Because typically in what I think is a really good model in Austria, the grant agencies will give you money for a biotech, but they expect you to carry typically somewhere between 30 and 40% of the costs yourselves. And so that's a powerful incentives for the angel investors because they know their money is gonna be leveraged, but it's also a powerful incentives for the grant agencies because they know that private money is also floating into that. And so with that in hand, we were able to open up our first lab, which was really a bit like a garage. Uh, it, we were uh, sub-tenants of another biotech com company um, close to the Vienna Biocenter. We really just had a couple of benches 
in that lab. At that point, um, neither the IST nor the um, the startup labs in Vienna existed, so we really had to had to slip under uh, sort of another biotech's uh, hood to to get started. And we built up a first team. So by the summer of 2018, it was the six of us, uh, and we started working. By winter, we were then able to, to score some first publicity wins. Um, we won the, the entrepreneurship prize um, of the Austrian government. Uh, we had some initial publicity, um, which also really helped us to raise awareness for what we were doing. Um, we then in spring were able to submit our first patent, uh, which for us was actually a big step because we started essentially with no own um, patent in hand, uh, which is probably something that if you're founding a biotech, uh, is a bit uncomfortable doing. Um, so my advice would definitely be try to be as close to the patent as possible, at least the filing of the patent um, before founding uh, a biotech. Um, but by spring, we actually had it. We had a very exciting licensing candidate for Victor Virginosis. By the summer, we then were able to top up our seed round. We brought new investors on board. We got a second FFG grant to um, push our licensing program. And we were able to move into our own lab. Uh, we're still a subtenant. We're now in the building uh, in the Leberstraße, uh, where Nabriva is our landlord. Um, but we have our own rooms, we have our own offices, and we increased the team size to about um, 12 people. And um, we then really were able to ramp up the scientific engine. And so since then, we've been very busy. We've been um, publishing now. We've been developing very innovative approaches for both phages and license. Uh, we've been part of some really big um, incubators. We've won some more prizes and are now at the point where um, again, as a biotech, we're sort of in that uh, in that very uncomfortable phase where we need to scale up again. Uh, we need to now raise a, a Series A um, to move ahead, uh, and that's that's for us the next piece of the puzzle. Yeah. So, a couple words on where we stand uh, scientifically. So we we started started the company with phages in mind. We wanted to do only phages, and we started with Staph aureus phages and E. coli phages. However, our first asset for some reason was an endolysin because we, um, as Alexander said, we, we wanted to look for um, the, uh, this very interesting disease, bacterial vaginosis. It's the most frequent vaginal infection. 25% um, uh, of women uh, worldwide affected by it. It's giant numbers. Um, and there is a keystone pathogen, Garnerella, that nobody was working on. Uh, so we tried to find a phage, but failed. It, we, the, the phage was not described, so we thought, yeah, but we 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 uh, we'll just look for it and find it. We couldn't. Uh, we also couldn't induce it from prophages, so we're quite frustrated. So started to look. Um, actually, isn't it possible to go for synthetic license, so not natural license? Um, so I looked on the genome of Gardnerella bacteria. On the Gardnerella bacteria, there are prophages. On the prophage. We found signatures for endolysins. We started to clone them, so synthesize the DNA. Um, we found some basic activity, then started a, a program of uh, directed evolution on that, and uh, and generated then highly potent Garnerella specific lysins um, that in the end became our uh, our first patent. And we uh, then uh, um, also beginning of this year uh, released an article. Uh, about that. It's a, the first of its kind. It would be a, a completely uh, breakthrough uh, therapy of bacterial vaginosis, uh, 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 addressing specifically Gardnerella without um, uh, uh, harming the beneficial parts of the microbiome consisting of the lactobacilli. At the same time, we're working on the phages, but also um, we saw some problems around the phages in the sense that, especially for E. coli, uh, it was very difficult to get the um, the, the resistance formation under control. Uh, on the other hand, we created a, a very interesting asset, PM399, uh, which is a cocktail of uh, complete bacteriophages against Staph aureus, which we also published, and we also have two patents pending on that. Um, however, at, at some point, we had to decide, okay, do we, do we continue with both related but somewhat different technologies of endolysins and bacteriophages? Um, and then at, uh, at the end of 2020, um, we decided to uh, pivot and focus completely on endolysins. And that's what we're doing from, from now on. Um, uh, since then, we put a team on endolysins to find further uh, endolysins against different species. And within, 
a few months actually, we found very strong hits against a number of other bacteria that are critical pathogens, uh, also on the WHO priority list, um, that, that uh, where, where breakthrough therapies are needed just because the standard of care is not working with uh, just even regardless of antibiotic resistances, there are problems with biofilms, there are problems with um, that, you, that you don't want to destroy the whole microbiome uh, with broad spectrum antibiotics and, and just there is a need for uh, more targeted approaches. Um, and so now uh, we're uh, yeah, focusing uh, the, the company completely on the endolysis. Yeah, and that's where uh, where we are now. The the Gardnerella endolysin is ready for the clinic. Uh, we're working on um, uh, advancing the um, uh, the pipeline of further um, endolysins to uh, basically in two years or so when when we'll have the first clinical trial um, with uh, with the Gardnerella lysin uh, ongoing uh, to be at the same stage with with a number of other programs. Um, and uh, so to, to finance the journey, uh, as Alexander said, we're uh, about to, rise, to raise some more uh, substantial funds. Do you want to comment some more on the, on the Series A, Alexander? I, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's clear that as a biotech, um, you essentially, you, you pour money into the oven and then you, you, you turn on the lighter and then you, you hope that that powers your science far enough so that by the time you, you run out of coals, uh, essentially, you have um, some more uh, financing that you have lined up. That's the reality. Um, and then that's obviously also sensible because it means that at every point you do ask yourself the hard question of which programs are worth continuing and which programs are uh, not worth continuing. Um, part of that is something that, that we also faced last year when the, the feedback from the investor community was very clear. Phages and license in the company uh, is, is too complicated and also requires slightly different skill sets. And so um, we had to focus. And I, I think we, we feel very happy with the decision that we took there um, with the license and now the synthetic biology platform, which we call the license builder, uh, which we've built around that, where basically we were repeating the trick that we did for Gardnerella, which is synthetic discovery in silico discovery of license, then um, assembling them, testing them, and then ending up with a strong IP around specific uh, synthetic uh, license. So that's where we stand. And maybe if you go to last slide, Lorenzo, that's a bit the, the look at the, at the team. Uh, this picture was taken in uh, autumn of last year um, in our lab in the Leberstraße, um, where we're, as, as we said before, at the moment, we're 14 people uh, in the company. So that's basically the, the quick tour of, of Lorenzo and myself and uh, of Fagomed and, and, and the way we, uh, we, we sort of advanced them over time and are very happy to to take your questions and uh, uh, and, and see um, which which sort of questions we left unanswered so far, uh, and then where we can sort of share some more light in our journey. Thank you very much for for the, all that. Um, so clear, so so smooth so far, but obviously I'm sure there's so much more that can be learned from from the path. It's never that easy and always a little bit bumpy. Um, maybe can come to that in the course of the discussion. Um, the first question actually refers to why did you choose endolysins and what was the reason to abandon actually the Fudge branch that you started off with? So, um, I mean, Alexander started to explain it. Yeah? The, we had two assets that, that were both really good. We saw Technically, that probably the lysins are smoother. So the, the phages are natural entities. You can improve them, but uh, you need to start with actual phages. And for many bacteria, the phages are not known. Um, also, um, because phages are so much more complicated, um, resistance formation against the phages is much more easy than against the uh, license and actually resistance formation against license seems to be close to impossible for the bacteria uh, because they they would have to completely change the uh, chemotype the, the chemistry of their peptidoglycan cell wall and that is not possible with a point mutation they would need to rearrange gene cassettes and um, the peptidoglycan is really conserved so th that really seems to be impossible if not almost impossible and 
um, with the synthetic lysine approach that we found, um, we, we saw that it's possible to generate lysines against virtually every bacterium. And so because this is more uh, versatile, more easy to manufacture, uh, and we needed to focus on, on one technology, we, we just couldn't have two, um, we saw a bigger potential with the license and so pivoted to the license. Mm -hmm. I think the other part is also there is a competitive dynamic there. And, you know, sometimes it, it seems like the best place is to be where nobody else is, but sometimes also a good place is where there are other people who are being successful. With phages, the reality is we don't have a clinical trial yet that has shown that phages work. And that has many different reasons. Yeah, a lot of it is due to bad science being done, uh, due to mismanaged clinical trials, um, also just the maturity of the field. Yeah, and, and we ourselves also had to, to invent new techniques of working with phages. But the reality is, at this point, nobody has shown in a in a randomized, you know, placebo-controlled, double-blinded trial that phages have a benefit. For license, we do. We have a first company that has been successful in a phase two trial. We have a company now in, in a phase three trial uh, with, with different license. So the technology is more mature, as, mm -hmm. as absurd as that sounds, because phages have a hundred year history and license have maybe 20 year history. But the license as a pharmaceutical is a more mature technology. And so that together with our bacterial vaginosis program, which we really like, um, was then at the end, the decision, if we have to focus on one, it has to be the license. Uh, we've obviously haven't given up on our phages. We have our patents there. We are in out licensing discussions with other companies to see what value we can salvage um, of, of that program. Um, but at some points in time, um, you know, it was in, in a certain way, it was definitely right to start with a portfolio of, of different programs because some are successful and some are not successful. And that's where hedging your bets as a biotech is important. But it was also right to then at some point say, okay, well, maybe let's focus now on one or the other and then move from that. And that's, I guess, part of building a business is learning when to take these decisions and when to sort of broaden out and when to, to narrow it back together. Actually, it reminds me very much of a discussion I had recently with a very successful biotech CEO uh, who told me about a meeting in, in San Francisco where like a ten, where about a hundred successful people like him gathered and one question was asked to the auditory, to the group, so how many of you actually pivoted away from the initial idea and the initial technology until they reached where they ended up to actually being successful? And about 80% of the hands went up. So it's a very, very common thing that we see that it requires a pivot actually to end up where one becomes really successful. You can be in a very different place than you started off with. And the second learning I would take from that is if you had known as much as you do now about phages, you may not have started the phage program at the beginning. So it also probably requires a certain point of um, yeah, optimism and maybe even naivety to to dive into something and then um, develop something that can that you only come across if you are starting to do something to take the first step. And then it takes once again, just a great team of people to, uh, to seize the opportunities that come along the way. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in, in retrospect, um, had we known, uh, like we, we wouldn't have started an endolysin company. Right, that, that's too far off. We could yeah. start a phage company, but we wouldn't have started an endolysin company. And so mm -hmm. um, I think uh, that, yeah, th that, that happens sometimes that you pivot. Um, I think you, you need to be open-minded enough that you question yourself all the time. Is this, you know, do, do I want to stick with my original idea and just go through it or um, actually open and change it? Mm -hmm. When one of our participants asked, so what about um, resistance, uh, resistance to end the license? Is that a problem too? No, it's, it seems to be uh, not a problem at all. So th there are different types of end that cleave different bonds in the peptidoglycan. Um, and depending on the bond that you cleave, that are there are bonds that are so conserved among all classes of bacteria that it looks as if uh, bacteria just can't change them. And um, uh, the, this is supported by literature data. So th there's a lot of data on 
uh, lab, um, so academic work on trying to generate resistance against endolysin was just never possible. We tried that, of course, with our Garnerella lysin 2 uh, and just passaged it again and again with um, submic, uh, sub-inhibitory concentrations of the endolysin, and it just didn't form resistance, a bit as expected. We also did a, another type of experiment where we looked for spontaneous uh, resistance formation, and there also we went to the limit of detection, which is uh, um, one, in our case, was one cell in 10 to the 9, and there was no spontaneous resistance formation. So it seems to be very difficult. I'm, I'm not excluding that it will never happen, but we, we see it a bit this way. If it ever happens, and if that selection, if uh, sort of if the product is used so much that resistance is selected in a human population, then the product will have been so crazy successful commercially that fine. Then, yeah, then at least that bought us a, a decade and somebody else needs to develop uh, another type of antibacterial in 10 or 20 years. But I think if, if you, in, in, I mean, th there's also a very good reason for, for sort of, um, despite my hope in the big business case for that being less of a problem, licenses are very specific. And so what we did with antibiotics is we started using the same class of antibiotics in food, in animal health, in human health. We used it for everything from the common cold to um, sepsis. And so the, the resistance, the pressure for selection was just huge on a global scale. If we now take bacterial vaginosis, I mean, our Gardnerella lysin, the only place it can work is against Gardnerella in bacterial vaginosis. It's gonna be very difficult applying that in food safety or in animal health. And the same will hold true for, for other types of, of lysins. So we would hope that as we move from broad spectrum to precision therapies, that also means that the resistance pressure is much lower on average across the population. And that means that it's a very good sign if after a month of passaging in the lab, which for antibiotics is plenty to induce full resistance for lysins, we can't find them yet. Um, there's a question that goes in a completely different direction away from, from the science. And that is how difficult was it actually to get funding from FFG, AWS and, and uh, angels uh, at a point where you did not have any IP, as you mentioned at the beginning, you had a concept, you had an idea, you had some PowerPoints, but nothing tangible on hand yet. How did you? Yeah, so what, what we did have was uh, we had a collaboration partner from Charité in Berlin who had some data, at least data, not a patent, but data. And um, the data were quite strong. And so that without that, it, it would not have been possible. Yeah? So at, at least we had uh, not, so via that collaboration, we had some data, but yes, it was an issue. Uh, we, we argued that um, uh, it would be possible to generate IP with an FFG program. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, we, we, we said the, 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 the space is just so wide that let us uh, sort of let us research on it. Let us look for opportunities and we will find something to patent. And indeed, now we have three patents pending on our phage program and one on the, on the Gardnerella program. So, um, yeah, but it was a it was a leap of faith by by the FFG. Um, I think, I guess, I mean, the, the, there is probably no project that starts without any uh, sort of uh, negative aspects, without any weaknesses. And where the um, the patenting was a weak, a clear weakness in our project, uh, probably we we compensated it with a good team, with a good concept, with a good plan, um, with good references. Uh, and that was good enough to uh, to to dis to make the both FFG and AWS and our uh, um, seed investors um, uh, take that leap of faith and, and trust that we will be able to generate some IP. I mean, I just saw the so the question pop up: Was there any sort of um, uh, close to death moment in the creation of the company? And I, and I mean, there definitely was one, and that was the the morning at which um, the FFG would send out their result of our grant application, because essentially the angel investor had said, well, you know, if the FFG believes in your project and they believe it makes scientific sense, then we're happy to give you um, the angel investment, which was I think 750,000 euros. So I mean, that, that's not nothing. Uh, it, was, it was actually a lot of money. Um, and the FFG grant was, um, I think it was 3 million euros over over three years. Um, and at the same time, sort of the FFG had told us, well, um, you know, you're only going to get money if the angel investor is actually actually pay up. Um, 
so that created sort of it created a, a shared interest, which was good, but it was a very scary moment um, that that morning of uh, of March in, in 2018, when you know, well, you're going to get an, an email in the morning, which will either tell you project approved or project not approved. If approved, then we can go out and call in the angel investors. If not approved, well, we're essentially back to to square one. Um, and so I think if if we'd start over today, then definitely we would have maybe used some more creative techniques of inching us closer to the IP. So I think, for example, the Startup Labs in Vienna is now a fantastic concept where I'm sure Lorenzo would have immediately gone in and, and done some, some fantastic science there with very little funding that we would have had in, had in place. When we started out, it just didn't exist. You either had to put a company in, in place and you had to hire a team and, and start working and you needed funding for that, or you couldn't really, really get started, at least the way we started out, which is we didn't have an affiliation to an institute where we could just, you know, waltz in and, and, and do some science there. So I think that that as many of you come from the academic world, the academic environment, if you have an idea you're passionate around and you find ways to start building up the data, the science, ideally the patterns around that beforehand, that will certainly help you on your journey. Um, then again, I think as Lorenzo said, we probably also had some, some strengths in our plan um, that then compensated for for that one weakness. What is the the longer the longer term plan for the company in terms of what is your exit model or business model? So I would say um, we we want to revolutionize how to think um, uh, anti uh, antimicrobial treatments, uh, and there um, there there is a big number of indications where there is a clear link to bacteria. And I'm, I'm expressing this in this complicated way because we're not only thinking about the classic um, uh, bacterial infections like pneumonia or, or sepsis, but uh, indications where um, there that maybe aren't even uh, regarded as a bacterial infection, but where there is a clear link to bacteria with a causative role. For example, even something like uh, rheumatoid arthritis or Alzheimer's, where everybody's talking about the gut-brain axis, where the, the gut bacteria have a clear influence on what's going on in our minds. So the, the, um, the, the model would be to uh, continue developing uh, different um, uh, uh, endolysins against different bacteria, along with the formulations to develop, to, to actually deliver them and target them, um, develop them to a certain point, and then probably partner up with uh, some bigger uh, pharma companies who would who would take over the uh, later stage uh, clinical development uh, and the marketing. So we see ourselves as a, a product engine uh, that develops the the engines up to a medium stage in the in the clinical pathway, and then uh, generates revenues by licensing them out. And that immediately means an exit would be <clears throat> sorry either we become a sustainable company. That, that, that is financed via licensing profits, um, uh, or we, at some point, uh, this could be bought up by, by a large pharma company and be integrated in a pharma company uh, or be made uh, um, uh, independent via an IPO, for example. Mm -hmm. You mentioned something that was asked a couple of times now in the, in the Q&A. Uh, what is the dosage form and how are in the license administered actually? Yeah, that depends on the indication that we're after. So for uh, for gonorrhea and bacterial vaginosis, uh, it's going to be a vaginal suppository. Um, for some of the other indications, it's going to be oral because the uh, because the infection is oral. So in a sense, you you have to deliver it to where the infection is. Yeah, in uh, if it's a sepsis, it's it's going to be a um, an intravenous infusion or or injection. Um, if it's if it's a lung infection, it could be a yeah, either an injection or an in in inhalation, for example. So it's it's uh, for for every indication, it's going to be a slightly different formulation. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think the the um, the the beauty, in a sense, of license is that they are at heart recombinant proteins, and with recombinant proteins, people have done a ton of stuff to get them to where they need to be in different parts of the body, to modify them, to change them. And so we can actually build on a lot of that, that learning that's out there. Mm -hmm. um, and that would also help us as we move ahead. And so for bacterial vaginosis, Lorenzo said, people have put proteins into vaginal suppositories. And again, we can, we can learn from that and we can mimic some of these successful approaches. Mm -hmm. 
Because one of the questions that also came up is how to save license other in the license from in yeah during oral administration actually how do you deal with it if you put it IV so you don't get it uh, clear too quickly or even uh, an immune reaction? Yeah, there there are tons of tricks um, uh, that that have not been applied yet with with license. There is one company in the United States. Um, that is developing uh, Staph aureus lysin uh, for bacteremia and endocarditis, and they inject it uh, intravenously. And mm -hmm. they're a pair, I mean, they, they didn't do anything there. They just inject the lysin. Uh, so the, um, uh, to improve the half-life in blood, one could dimerize it to make it bigger and reduce renal filtration. One could add PEG uh, to hide it from the immune system. One could um, in a in uh, yeah in a, in a in a targeted mutagenesis approach, uh, reduce the immunogenicity of the T cell epitopes to to reduce the immune response. Um, one can fuse it to um, albumin binding proteins again to also hide it from the immune system and increase the uh, the radius to reduce renal filtration. So there are tons of tricks that have not yet been, yet been applied. Um, we believe this is an emerging drug class, and uh, it, it's a good sign that we're not the only fools working on this, but there, there are a couple of other pro, uh, uh, companies uh, starting. Uh, th there's a lot of white space, and um, uh, we believe there, th th there, will be a lot, there will be appropriate solutions for every problem. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the good thing about doing a biotech is you don't even need to know yet what the solution is going to be. That, that's the beauty of it. Yeah. So I think for for us, it was always the the ambition to have at least one program which is successful and which advances, um, obviously, uh, as fast as possible into the clinic. But then we also need to experiment around that. And, and that's what we did. Yeah. We initially thought our phage staff program was going to be the, the front runner and we experimented with Gardnerella license. Um, turns out that was much more successful. So now we have a front runner program with a Gardnerella license that's actually ready to go into the clinic next year. Um, and we're experimenting with other pathways of synthetic license and other types of, of bacteria. And I think that's that to us always was that sort of diversification and you know, sort of um, diversifying the scientific risk. I mean, I'm not a scientist, but to me always what I, the one thing I've learned is uh, no experiment uh, works like you expected the, the first time. And so if you apply that to the programs, then you need to sort of spread out your scientific risk. And I'm assuming that's what every PhD student does as well. Yeah? He spreads out his scientific risk across different things that, that might work or not work. And as a biotech, essentially, we're, we're doing the same. Mm -hmm. As we are slowly running out of time, and I hope that we have a number of people uh, listening to us who are actually considering the starting a startup. So what would be your maybe takeaway message or, or advice for people that first think about doing it and actually, and for those that are really about to make the jump? Words of wisdom. I would say, uh, do it, yeah, D just do it. Uh, so I, I think I was very cautious in, uh, in, in thinking about it for so long and then, um, uh, and, and then doing it only after having a, a great idea sort of brought to me via Alexander. Um, I, I have colleagues who, uh, for example, one friend of mine uh, was at McKinsey, not at BCG, uh, but, but he quit. Um, without any idea, just with, with the idea in mind, okay, I'm going to start a company now. I don't know what, but I'm going to start something. So first of all, he quit McKinsey because he said, I just don't have time to think about it while working in this job. Um, and then he did it. And now he has three companies. So it's uh, you, w if you think hard about it and, and start networking and, and uh, uh, then talk with, with, with people who maybe, maybe many professors have, have something uh, as an idea, but then they don't dare to, or they don't want to uh, quit their professor job uh, to start a business, um, but meet somebody who starts it. So um, th there is need for people who want to start something. I think the, the other part is um, find people who believe in this together with you. Um, think about who you need in your team. I think in, in our case, um, we're a bit of a, a unique situation maybe that we have sort of a, a pair that runs a company together um, and that, that works 
on average really well. It, it has some challenges also, obviously. Um, but a big part is we share a joint um, sort of mindset. Uh, we both spend 10 years at BCG. We have a lot of common culture tools, um, nuances that we bring to the table and that works really well. And sort of we, we are able to, to balance each other out because obviously I know squat about science. Uh, Lorenzo does know a lot about business, but he prefers to focus on the science. So um, it, it kind of, it, 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 makes a, it makes for a good team. Um, and uh, if you're start about to start a business, you will need a team. You maybe won't need, you know, the, the types of Lorenzo or, or myself, but you will need other people who you can work with and depend with. And so find people who you can uh, enthuse with, with your idea, who are willing to embark on, on that journey with you. Um, and then, yeah, run against walls until they, they break down, which is really the only way to, to do it. Well, I think these were very nice last words to, to close the session, actually. So um, to everybody, let's do it, yeah, do it. And uh, I think since you started and looking back, the, 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 the situation in Austria, which was already not quite bad, improved further. I mean, we have a, an ecosystem in Austria and a, and a funding system in Austria that is really uh, extraordinary if you compare it with many other um, countries and cities. So there's really uh, not much reason not to try it. There is little risk involved, personal risk. I think there's a lot to gain in terms of experience, also economic upside and also especially impact upside if, if scientists turn into entrepreneur and try to turn something scientific into a product, a service, a company. Um, and we can only, I think, collectively reinforce the, the statements of the two of you to, to actually try it out. Nothing can happen but good things. So with that, thank you again very much for, for being here today, Alexander and Lorenzo. Thanks for inviting us. And I'm looking forward to read more about uh, successes out of Fagomate and, um, and to read much more about other startups that follow your examples. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks Alexander, for listening today. Bye, Thanks. Bye. Bye.